Welcome to the Connor's Corner segment of Ask the Lawyer. When I was a little boy, one TV series I used to really like was with Barry Sullivan and our next guest, Clue Gulliger. And who did you play back then, sir? It was a television series, uh, my first television series, in old, old time, long time ago. And Barry Sullivan was an actor out of New York, a really fine actor. And uh, he was uh, known for playing in movies with people like Barbara Stanwyck. So I was, I was in awe, of course, very impressed. I was a new young actor out of New York, and I came to Hollywood and, and got this series. Uh, lucked into it, and I was a cowboy from Oklahoma. I rode horses, and I could handle the part of uh, that I was given to play of Billy the Kid, a guy from actually from uh, he was from Brooklyn. He was, right. And uh, uh, he and his mother came out, and uh, but he he became uh, a bad guy, uh, according to our historical sources. He became a paid killer. And he was hired by a, a big rancher named Tunstall in New Mexico in that territory. And we were fairly new Western uh, atmosphere then. Uh, the West didn't last long, Mike. It was a fairly short period. And this was in the middle of it. And this was a rough country. And people settled uh, things, I understand, with, with weapons. I come from Oklahoma. And that was a fairly rough land. Uh, not, not when I lived there particularly, but a little before that. The Indians, which I'm a part of, I'm part Indian, American Indian. And, and uh, we were brought up from the south. Uh, the white uh, white uh, government uh, at that time. That sounds funny to say white government, but I was an Indian. They wanted our land and and uh, you know uh, everything we developed. So they they took it. It was it was a strange situation, and we ended up in Indian territory and became Oklahoma. And it was a mean country, very vile, violent, and uh, it was unruly. Criminals hung out there and so forth and so on. But when Oklahoma became a state, uh, it was more civilized. I'm not sure it is now, but it was then. And uh, we had, uh, so I was brought up in Oklahoma and I rode horses and I lived in the country part time and in, in a little town called Muskogee, Oklahoma. And uh, my father was a judge. My mother worked for the Veterans Administration. When I got out of high school, I joined the Marine Corps with my cousin. He came through town one time. I said, where are you going? He said, well, I'm going to join the Marine Corps. I said, wait a minute, I'll go with you. And so that's how I got into the military. And I wasn't very adept at that. And when, when, I, was, uh, when I got out uh, several years later, I decided I wanted to be an actor. And, and God knows why someone decides that, Mike. Yeah, well, why did but you? I, I, I did. Yeah, that, that I was running one day at Camp Pendleton on a dirt road, exercising you know, in my own time. And I, I came across an epiphany sort of experience, I, I call it, where I said, I want to act. And I didn't even know what that was, uh, I'll be honest with you. I didn't know what acting or what an actor or anything. But I said, I want to act. Now, this is, this is the truth, the honest God's truth. I, it's a strange phenomenon to me, it still is, why I decided I want to be an actor. My, I had a cousin who was an actor, and he, a second cousin, and my father grew up with him in, in the Oklahoma Indian Territory. His name was Will Rogers. He became very famous uh, in your part of the land, in New York. And he uh, he was on the stage in New York and he was in the radio and he wrote for newspapers. Very, very fine entertainer. I met him a couple of times, but I didn't know him. Uh, uh, so I, maybe it had something to do with that. We had talked about Will Rogers from time to time in my family. And uh, so I, I went to New York and, 
and got lucky and started working on live television, and which was really a harrowing experience. The most, the most interesting thing that ever happened to me in live television, I was on Omnibus, which was a big show, a variety show of all kinds of happenings in New York City, biggest show in America at that time. And they brought us out from my, my university, Baylor University, where I was going to school with our, an original drama. They liked it, so they put a little adaptation of it on Omnibus. I had to say a prayer, Mike. And as I was saying the prayer on live television, a lady costume, a wardrobe lady, was taking off my pants and putting on new pants while the camera was on my face saying, my, I was saying my a prayer, and I, I've never forgotten that. It was the scariest thing I've ever heard. And I mean, I've, I've never heard of anything like that, but they had to do things because the show was a continuous drama, a continuous entertainment, no breaks, and the mistakes were incorporated into the entertainment, and that that was a... And luckily, we got through the prayer, and my pants were changed. <laughs> and... <laughs> It's ridiculous, I know. Where did you live when you were doing that? What what part of New York City were you living in? We lived all over. I lived on 91st Street in a little apartment and, and in Manhattan at that time. And we uh, with that summer, Miriam and I had, uh, we were picked up right across the street from Lincoln Center, taken to uh, Long Island on a little park where we were counselors, camp counselors. My wife was pregnant. We would go on the rowboat with the children and they would punch her in the stomach and say, what's that? And she was pregnant, you know, all swelled up with her, in her belly with, with John, uh, the man who became a filmmaker later. And uh, I thought that was weird, but <laughs> that's the way. You know, children are very inquisitive. I enjoyed that summer a lot. One of the best summers I've ever had, probably in my whole life, and it's been a long life. I'm 90 years old, Mike, and I had never been kissed, and I, <laughs> uh -oh. and, and so I, uh, I've had a long life, and that's one of the most pleasant summers, I, I think, I've ever lived through, you know, and my wife and I were very much in love, and Miriam was a, a singer, uh, a really good singer, classical singer, and, and she was trying to, uh, you know, spread her wings in New York also. So we were, we had a very exciting time as young, young artists in your, in your wonderful city. We consider New York our home, even though we moved to California later when the industry moved to California. And uh, we love, I love California a lot. Miriam always loved New York better. And uh, my son, John, and his beautiful wife, Diane, uh, are both in the business. But they, they worked in, they lived in the Lower East Side. They, they went to New York at one time. And that was a very exciting time for them. Several years, they worked very hard as waiters. And John was a musician and working in film as much as, you know, as much as he could and trying to get in, you know, becoming, he was an embryonic artist and uh, it was, it was a, it was a splendid time for them. He keeps telling me he, he, he I think that's one of the most dear times in his entire life, uh, his time in the Lower East Side. <laughs> The uh, uh, Hell's Angels lived right around the corner, <laughs> and, right. uh, they, but they they had such good friends. I went there and visited, of course, and uh, Mayor and I, and we we loved where they lived, uh, and we loved their friends, and and we went to wonderful little little joints to eat and things like that. It was just, uh, that was a good time for, for them and, and for us too, actually. Now, let me ask you something. A lot of us right now, if we, we have the Western Channel at our homes, we turn on the Virginian, oh, you know, right. each night. And of course, you were, you are in the Virginian for a number of years. What was it like on, on that set? Well, I had a good friend 
who uh, ran the Virginian, he and Lou Wasserman, the head of Universal Studios, created the long form that the Virginian ended up in. It was a long form, motion picture length. And we shot one almost every week, and uh, which was impossible. But we did it, and it wasn't fancy. It was uh, good stories, wonderful writers like Borden Chase, Barry Chase's father, people like that wrote for us. John Williams scored uh, many of the shows. Uh, it was, uh, and John became, uh, as you know, one of the one of the major composers in motion pictures. Right. And, and I used to go watch. I, I used to go watch John score. Uh, three of us watch. We used to hang out where they they scored on the sound stage. Uh, uh, Quincy Jones and. And uh, uh, the one-eyed actor that I, Sammy Davis, who was such a great performer, he and I, and Quincy, the three of us used to hang out. I don't know if Quincy remembers that or not, but we would hang out in when they recorded these these huge, beautiful uh, orchestras recorded all these Western shows and uh, every show, in fact, that Universal did. And because we just, I love, I, I love music, and I I love to hear the big orchestras play and these great instrumentalists, you know, who could sight read it on site without rehearsal. Just, it was like, it was like a concert for us watching. And Quincy, of course, used that and became so gifted in his creating music. And uh, Sammy wanted to be an actor. <laughs> and he was a great actor, but he was also a dancer and a singer and entertainer, told great stories and kind of lost his way in acting, but he did act in New York on the stage and did very well with a couple of shows. But basically, and he did a little film, but not much. He just, that was his, that was his passion. And he always wanted to act and he just never cracked that ceiling that, I don't know, he, 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 I don't know what happened to him. He was very tiny, he was a tiny man but extremely gifted in, in, in many of the uh, arts, singing and dancing, and he could act. He, I thought he was a good actor myself, but it, it was hard to cast him. He just had one eye, <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and, and he was squinting, and he, uh, he was black, and, but, but he, he was, he was, he, I thought he was an extremely good actor. Uh, you'd have to talk with some of the producers get their opinions, uh, but he wasn't cast as much as I thought he should have been. Let me ask you about a film that I I thought you gave a great performance is, The Name the Killers. Can you tell us about that film, and who else was in it with you? Well, a guy who became president (laughs) killed me in that film, Ronald Reagan. (laughs) He was a... I really like uh, Mr. Reagan. He was he was he was a very sweet man, very kind, very gentle. I know that he his politics uh, sometimes disagreed with mine because I was an Indian, of course, uh, some Indian blood, not a lot, and I I, I like that. And uh, he uh, during his administration uh, canceled the uh, government support of Indian schools. And one time I gave a, an address to a high school in Montana. A friend of mine from high school taught up there, taught music in that high school. He got me up there to do the graduation address to the children. And he said, Clue, could you talk Mr. Reagan into rescinding that? Because if the Indian schools are stopped, the Indian schools will not go to, the, the Indian kids will not go to school with the white kids. They just are too too intimidated. But, you know, a president doesn't have all of that power to to rescind the laws and change Congress and so forth. So they continued and the schools were withdrawn, the Indian school support from the government. And the Indians just stopped going to school. Uh, you know, uh, they, got, well, they got school, they picked it up wherever they could in those days, apparently. And I uh, always regretted that. But his wife, Nancy Reagan, was a wonderful actor. She used to work on my show, The Tall Man. Every year she did a show for us. She was very, extremely talented, in my view. And I just loved having Nancy on the air. 
and Mr. Reagan would come down. And one day I had and visit her. And one day, I, you know, before we did the, this movie, this is a long time before he was a big star. And he came down and visited his wife on the set. And one time I had a hard time getting on a horse. It was a big, tall horse. My original horse, Randolph Scott's pony. Huh. Uh, Randolph Scott was a major Western actor uh, in motion pictures. And he had a horse. And I, uh, his name was Tiny. And I was, I inherited his horse. But one day the horse fell. So they put him out to pasture. And they gave me another horse that looked like him with the flaxen mane and tail, looked just like, but he was tall. He was really big. I had a hard time getting on him sometimes. And Mr. Reagan said, Clue. I said, yes. He said, Clue, the way I did it. I got on the horse as best I could. And then they said, action. And they started <laughs> after I got on the horse. So they, he talked that way very slow, in a kind of a, a cumbersome sort of talk. But he was giving me advice, and I was a real cowboy, and he wasn't. But he could ride a horse. He looked pretty good on a horse. And he had a ranch in Malibu, uh, an exclusive area near the ocean. He, he had a lot of money. And uh, later on, they moved to more of the center of California on a ranch. He always liked to live on a ranch. He, he loved horses. And he was, I liked Mr. Reagan, personally. But... I was on a show with Lee Marvin, The Killers, the movie you were talking about. And right. Mr. Reagan and Lee did not get on. Lee, for some reason, resented him, just hated his guts, and would make fun of him. And he would would have a dress rehearsal. We would have a rehearsal, for example, of a scene. And, and Lee would come in and say, now watch this. He told me that. I was just a kid. And he said, look, and he would do the scene a certain way in rehearsal, which was brilliant. He was such a brilliant actor. And he, uh, well, and for that, that movie, The Killers, he won the best actor uh, in the British Isles for their Academy Award, by the way. He was very good in that film. And I thought, very quiet, understated, a killer. And he was really, really up there with his acting in that best best death scene I've ever had, I've ever seen. He did at the end of the film. But and Mr. Reagan, obviously a brilliant man himself, knew, knew exactly what was happening. So when, when Lee would go on and do this one scene a certain way, and then they'd rehearse it again to see if they got it all right with the lights and the sound and the camera moves, and we'd rehearse it again. And Lee would say, now watch this. He would do the scene again and change it. Completely different, but a brilliant performance each time. And Mr. Reagan matched him, in my <laughs> opinion. Mr. Reagan would do it and respond to it, but he would do it exactly the same way he'd rehearsed it at home in his bathroom, Mr. Reagan, and uh, or driving on the freeway to work. He didn't change any inflection, any delivery, he, it was a, and it worked. He, he was really a great, great scene from Reagan and and then we did it a third time to be sure we had everything right and Lee said watch this he did it another way the third time and Mr. Reagan did it the same way but it worked it was a really it, it was more it, it was so exciting I've never forgotten that moment with the with the, now, you know Mr. Reagan I don't think was the accomplished uh, actor that Lee Marvin became but he was good. He was a movie star. He did a lot of good work. And uh, but Lee was an exceptional actor, and uh, in my view, and he just he just tore it up when he got on the screen. And uh, but Lee, but Mr. Reagan matched him in that scene, and I was I was there just with my mouth open watching these two masters work, and I learned a lot from that scene that. You you can't you know you you can't put your personal feelings in, into a rehearsal for a motion picture or a play. You have you have to put those aside and just play the part. Lee couldn't do that, and he still was brilliant. So, may I don't know what I learned from that, but but I I was there. 
I saw it with my own eyes. It was it was a wild experience for a young actor, you know. Yeah, who was your director in that film? Don Siegel. Don Siegel, uh, right? Man, Dirty uh, Harry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Dirty Harry. Ah, boy, you 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 know your film cinema. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dirty Harry with Clint Eastwood. That's where Clint. Uh, he didn't become a star there. I think he became a star with Sergio Leone's uh, westerns out of Italy. Uh, but I I think he solidified himself with Dirty Harry with the American public, and Don let him do that. He 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 liked. They they bonded. They were very close. And uh, Clint always said that he learned a lot from Don, watching Don work, being with him and, and listening to him. And I suppose he did, because he became he became a master director. And uh, Clint, he's still directing. He's directing another picture right now. Right. He's an old man. He can hardly walk. Is he older than you, or are you older than him? Uh, you know, that's a damn good question. <laughs> if he, if he, if he's older than 90 and directing, that's a miracle. Now I know Mr. Mr. Hitchcock was an old man in a wheelchair, uh, directing. I don't know how good the films were when he was in the wheelchair. I thought they were good, but what do I know? And I enjoyed his films when he was an invalid or when he was, you know, moving around. Well, I just thought he had the knack of putting uh, moments together on the screen that, that were almost unmatched. and uh, But he became infirm, a real invalid. And he they, he directed the birds in a, in a damn wheelchair. And, oh, I didn't know that. I, yeah. thought that was, I thought that was a pretty good picture. Yes. And, uh, yeah, it scared the hell out of me when I saw those damn blackbirds attacking people. And, <laughs> you know, they killed friends of mine. And I said, oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, Suzanne Plachette will never be the same. It pecked her to death. And I, 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 but I didn't care because I said, well, this is showbiz. We'll just let the birds do what they want to do. And I went down and watched. They had a huge cage erected on the soundstage, almost covering the entire interior of this soundstage at Universal. And they had these damn birds perched on these uh, little, uh, you know, perched up there on, on strips of wood in the cage. And it was scary uh, because to see them up there, we knew they were going to be made to kill people and to attack all kinds of, you know, and cause havoc. The birds, and, you know, tippy headman and so forth. Later on in life, I did a show with Don Johnson at the big amphitheater universal they have for entertaining tourists. And we went on the stage, and I played Don Johnson's a great actor, uh, manager. He was a young actor. And in the, in, out there was sitting with some kids. One was a 14-year-old beautiful girl, Tippi Hedren's daughter. And he, she was Don Johnson's sweetheart. She was 14 years old. I said, oh, my God, this is Hollywood. I have to get used to it. I'm from Oklahoma. All I knew was about these little horses. I rode horses. I didn't know about these beautiful young girls going with these older men. And and later on, they got married. They were very much in love. And uh, and uh, Don, I thought, also, mo most people who work in Hollywood are exceptional actors. But they wouldn't be hired over and over. And Don, I thought, was one of those special actors that I always thought. He was the most handsome man in Hollywood at that time to me. And I said, I, I was in awe of how he looked, but how he could act, he was so natural. And and this beautiful girl, Tippi Hedren's daughter, was his sweetheart, the 14 year old girl. I said, oh man, ooh. And I didn't know what to think about that, but I realized that they were in love. And, uh, and she was out there watching us work. And uh, I thought, boy, this is really something. <laughs> Is that bad for me to think all that? No, I don't think so. You know, <laughs> let, let, now when you talk about acting, you know, I'm I'm looking up yeah. IMBD. You have 165 credits, and let's say 100 uh -oh. episodes of The Virginian is one. So, how many uh, acting roles did you have over your career? Oh, I'd say over 500, I would say. Uh, and and uh, you know, I, I've been asked that. And to count how many acting pieces I've done, 
separate roles. You know, it has to be in the hundreds. And I've always thought, you know, counting, you know, episodic television and motion pictures and things like that. I, I to me, it was went up in the hundreds. I, I've always felt it was over uh, five hundred. They a lot of these these things you looked up. They don't give you credit for acting and a lot of uh, things you do around the country. You do motion pictures for independent small companies around the nation and even in foreign countries and and they they're not listed sometimes but i think and that sounds like a lot say well you don't have time you you, you don't have time to do over 500 separate pieces well in in my thinking i did but uh i could be wrong and uh that's a lot of acting uh mike and and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not the greatest actor that ever came down the pike. It was hard for me to memorize lines. I even, ever since the university time, I had a hard time with lines. Seems funny, professional actor, but I was never good with lines, and I'm not ashamed of that because, I, you know, I could act and I, I can hold my own a little bit with some of these people, and uh, you know, I remember doing a a little part with young Kurt Russell on, on, a, on a thing called Police Story. And we killed Danny Bonaducci, who was a young actor. He played the villain. <laughs> and I love that, killing <laughs> Danny Bonaducci, who had been what, on, uh, on the Partridge family. <laughs> and he was one of the kids. And I said, oh, my God, I'm killing one of the Partridges. Okay, let's get him, Kurt. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> but Kurt grew up to be a major motion picture star, a great actor, and always a nice, kind, giving actor, and always a good man. And he married a he married a very gifted woman, Goldie Hawn. They had a beautiful, gifted child, who was an actress and a marvelous actress. And I, I, I'm so pleased to have worked with Kurt. He was a young man. He had finished his Disney uh, training as a young child actor, and he was, uh, you know, his late teens, maybe early twenties when I worked with him. But he, but he, you know, he he matched. I was an experienced actor from New York, but he matched me line for line, and much better than I was. And I thought, boy, this is really, this is really something, because I'd work, I'd watch Kurt as a child actor for years with Mr. Disney's films. And I thought, wow, this is a big time. And I was so pleased to work with young Kurt Russell. And then he became a major, major star. And, and I working with Tarantino and people like that. And I just, I just fell out of my chair. If somebody had a look back on your career clue, what performance would you want him to see? What stands out most in your mind? Well, I did a thing... Uh, with, with, with a great uh, filmmaker, uh, what, what's that filmmaker's name? They did Par for the Course. Yeah. Spielberg. Yeah, my son's here with me to help me out. All right. <laughs> he babysitting me while I do this uh, interview with you, Mike. And uh, Spielberg uh, was doing a movie, and it, it was a half-hour show for Universal. And he came by one day, and he said, "Come on, I need some help." He was a young kid, about 19. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I have this show, and, and I had a good actor out of 20th Century Fox, but he backed out. He decided he didn't want to do it. And so uh, could you do it for me? I said, well, you know, I've always just decided, it's ironic, that I wouldn't do things real fast on the spur of the moment. That is tough enough without rehearsal. We don't rehearse in film, by and large. And, and so he said, well, just read the script for me, would you? And I said, I sure will, Steve. He was a kid. And I read it, and it was so good. I couldn't turn it down, Mike. I did par for the course. It was about a dying professional golfer, dying of cancer. And boy, it was a good script. I, I, so I said, okay, let's do it. So I started, and uh, uh, it, it was a Saturday when he came to me. We started Monday morning. And uh, we did that show. I guess that was probably the best show probably I'd, I'd been associated with up until that point. And prob maybe afterwards, too, it, w it was 
it worked very nicely. And Steve was doing a show about, it was about death. And this kid, Steven Spielberg, 19-year-old kid, directed a show about death. I said, man, we're in for it now. And it was brilliant. He was so good in directing. You know, I was just a, just a journeyman actor, just lucky to get work. But this kid, I didn't know who he was, didn't know anything about him. He directed this show about death at Universal with me, this, this two-bit actor starring in it. And I said, now, wait a minute. This is not right. He doesn't know what he's doing. And when he started in, and I saw that, I saw that film, it blew me away. And I tried, I went, he doesn't know this, but I went to the union, tried to get him nominated for best director for uh, that, that, you know, what that category fit in the movie. And uh, they just laughed at me, said, are you kidding? Come on. And so it didn't, I didn't, they, they paid no attention to me, but it, it was a very powerful half hour show about death. And I still am very, very impressed with his directing. I know you're self-deprecating, but you were in 500 separate episodes, and you were always memorable. You know, I, I, I mean, I can't think of any time that I saw you, whether it was a, a TV show that was, you know, you maybe had 10 minutes in or, or a full-length movie like <laughs> The Killers. But every time you were on the screen, the camera's drawn to you, and you're you're an interesting actor you're a guy that you, the eye just focuses on and people want to listen to you and people like you and they like you as an actor oh, that's so nice boy that's boy oh boy i need a, i need a tape recorder out here in hollywood okay well we'll boy, send you a tape is, for this that, that's a beautiful compliment uh, especially from a professional like yourself and I know you work with your wife and your lovely wife. And, and I, uh, hi, <laughs> how are you, Miss Connors? I know you. Well, say there, hello, Beth. Okay. Uh, l- listening. And Can you I, hear I, me? I, I, yes. Can I you hear me? I appreciate your husband's kind words. Oh, you're a sweetheart. You, I was in love with you when I was a girl. Oh, oh my. get out of here. Uh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> are you oh, kidding? I you thought know, you're so nice to say that. Now I'm in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, but you, uh, I am part Choctaw. Oh, are you an actor? No, I, I no, no, no. I, I was a singer. Do you remember Fred Waring? Do I remember Fred Waring? <laughs> I worshipped him. Are you kidding? <laughs> I, you know, I'm an old guy, and I know I, I just love Fred Waring. Oh, I still do. He was a great musician. Well, and he got six people together to sing, and he got a little orchestra together. That's right. He was magnificent, one of our great artists in America, I think. Well, that was that was the last show I was with before I got married to this fella, Mike Connors. <laughs> oh, my God. Get out of here. Yeah. You were with Fred Waring? I was. Well, a... then I watched, I watched and listened to you <laughs> all the time he was my idol wearing was so gifted oh. he, could, he could take he could take people like you the, the great artists and mold them together like nothing i've ever heard it was so and he did it frequently i did, he was on a lot every week and and i don't know how he had time to do that he must have worked himself to death he was a pro. He, died, he, but... he loved it. He loved it. And he, I was just, uh, I was fortunate to have been a part of his show there toward the, toward the end of his career. Um, Boy, because, you could, you could read it. Were you a singer with him? I was a singer. I, yes, I was the, the contralto soloist. Well, you could really sing then. Well, What's your first name? <laughs> Beth. I'm Beth. <laughs> Ben, I tell you, I'm 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 so impressed. I'm <laughs> you say, well, you're an actor. You shouldn't be impressed. Well, I'm knocked out. No, that I'm talking with the singer for Fred Waring. No, I listen. Mean, my God, you, no, you no, know, no. He had the choice of everyone in America. No, everyone wanted to work with Waring, and for him to choose you, that I I hate to say, I don't mean to sound like too complimentary, but. You must have really been gifted, Beth, and I. Uh, it's an honor to talk with well, you. Well, you're a sweetheart. That. Well, okay. So now, so now, my my heart throb is telling me that he's that he, <laughs> oh, that God. he's that he's oh, proud of. Don't uh, take proud. that in front of Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, Mike, 
say with his mouth open and say, what did you just say, Beth? You're married to me. Leave that, leave that old crazy actor out of it. No, you, you, I, Mike was exactly right. When you got on screen, there was a lot, there was something that just came through your eyes that well, filled you, you, the I camera. I can't believe you're saying that. You're so sweet to even, even think that because I, uh, you know, an actor, in, in my town, in this town, in California and Hollywood, we do not get to rehearse, generally speaking, these uh, entertainments we, we, we get paid to do. And it's, such, it's such an honor to do them. Some of them are magnificent pieces of work. And uh, to be involved in something like that. But I tell you, uh, it was scary. Yeah. Because you don't know how it's going to come out. You don't get to rehearse. You don't, you don't know what it's going to be. Right. In a theater, uh, live tele, uh, live live, uh, live stage work in New York or all around the nation or anywhere, you get to rehearse and you know about what's going to happen, right? And how an audience is going to receive it. Generally, you, you have a good idea, right? You have no idea what's going to happen in film. You just and they spend millions and millions of dollars on these wonderful technical films in Hollywood, and we have no idea how they're going to be received, how they're going to come out. Right. And I know when John directs a movie, he gets he gets a script, my son, and he reads it, and he worked for, he worked for the, I know he doesn't like me to say this, <laughs> and you know, he's a little oh, embarrassed, go but ahead. he worked for the wine, for he, go he ahead, made five say movies it. for the wine scenes. Oh, and, and, uh -oh. and Harvey, Harvey was his boss, uh -oh. and, and he uh, and, and 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 he just had no idea what was going on if, if it was going on with Harvey and right. and his brother Bob uh, was his, was his partner was Harvey's partner Bob Weinstein, and the company dissolved when 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 the trouble came around with Harvey. But before that, John had made five major motion pictures with them and and I, I, I say that around I get a kick out of saying that now but John said no no don't 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 say that Pop that's, that's, <laughs> oh that's please. okay tell but <laughs> I want to tell you because you know the wine scenes are out of New York and 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 uh they are they're they're your co inhabitants there and uh, I know that he he was he was really uh, he, he was seemingly he didn't do right with, with the with the, the young women, and so well, look, that, uh, I regret that. That but may have good, been so. A good film man. Listen, but that he, may he have been. Make films. Yes, that's what I'm saying. There were there have been extraordinary um, filmmakers and actors that have worked with him. So your son, goodness, he shouldn't be ashamed of that. It's it's two different things. I agree with you. I don't think he should be ashamed of that at all. I think he's very proud because these were the these are the premier independent filmmakers of America and possibly the world, and I I I want him to be proud of having made okay. these. But do y'all ever? Do you ever get to? Scenes and he, you know, the sexual aggression of man. We make movies about it, but when it comes down to us and our neighbors are involved in something like that, it, it's heartbreaking and terrifying. And we just don't, we don't know how to handle it. And, and John, I'm sure, was puzzled and, and upset about it. I'm but, sure so. <laughs> I'm just, no, no, no. Cut it. It's Stop hard to, about it. yeah, said, it's okay. hard to understand human nature. We can't do it. But, Clue, thank you for your memories. Thank you for sharing the time with us. We really appreciate your career. Thank your son you should so be proud much. of you as you should be proud of well, him. Well, you're so sweet, Mike. You and Beth are, well, must be a wonderful couple. You come, you and come and see talented. us in Brooklyn. You're at the top of, you the top of your profession, no. Mike, and I, I. It's an honor to talk with you, and you, your questions are right on, spot on. <laughs> well, listen, Thank you, Chloe. Me to tell why us don't, why don't you? I, I like. Why don't you come see us in Brooklyn one day? Okay. I will. Oh, I love New York. <laughs> you know, right. uh, we, we, we figured that was our, me and I. We wanted to stay in New York, but the industry moved to California, so we came out with it. <laughs> well, we love you so much. Thank you so much for being on the show. Well, Beth, I, I honored to talk with the wearing 
Uh, oh, I mean, I, I can't believe you work with Fred Warner. That, that's very impressive to me. And I'm not kidding because I'm a musician and I, I'm not a good one, but I, I, I was a French horn man for many years. Oh, I love so I know the about, French horn. I know horn. how good Faring, uh, he was a great uh, musician. Whether, you know, I know he played, he played uh, to appeal to the common man, but boy, that music was so right on when, when he made music. You know, you were part of that. I'm very impressed. Okay. Thank you for the interview, Mike. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it greatly. We love you. Thanks for the stories.